After our discovery about the CD, the vicar was impatient to visit the studio where Billy G records, although not sufficiently to hurry his beloved Earl Grey. I too was excited at the chance of meeting her. Before leaving, the vicar muttered something about petty rock stars always having ridiculous security and spent a few minutes downloading an image from her website and playing around in one of the graphics programs on his computer. He took the results off his printer and hassled me off the Betsy. It was one of those times, those very frequent times, when I hated the Vicarmobile and wished that he owned any one of a number of perfectly satisfactory sports cars so that when we arrived, we could have arrived in something like style. What makes it worse is the fact that he always asks me to drive, so I look like a bloody chauffeur. He had some calls to make and he would never dream of using his mobile phone while driving. He sat in the back with his phone, Filofax and Palm Pilot, everything but his laptop, which was being mended for reasons we don't need to go into. He loves mobile gadgets, particularly ones that store phone numbers. I think he even has a credit card with phone numbers in it. Out of his clutch bag, he brought the sheet of paper that I'd seen at Real World. He looked over it and then read aloud what had been written across the bottom. Why not the police? And then again, more slowly, why not the police? He thought for a while, during which time I manoeuvred us safely along Old Kent Road, street name supplied at random, before turning into, yes, you Monopoly players guessed it, Whitechapel Road. He looked up a number in his file of facts. I learned later that it was Angela Barnett, a columnist with the Financial Times. Now, in real life, Angela was actually a man, but there seemed so few women in this book that I thought it was better to give him a quick sex change. I hope his wife doesn't mind. Hello, Angela. The vicar here. I'm not sure if the voice at the end knew who it was. We met over lunch at Sir Edward Heath's many moons ago. Well... If you're going to drop names, I suppose dropping in the fact that you met over lunch with a former Prime Minister pretty much comes top of the list. Yes, fabulous view. I remember Sir Edward saying that he had once been told that it was one of the top ten views in the country, and his reply was that he could not imagine what the other nine could be. The vicar boys hand over the receiver and told me, Edward Heath's house overlooked Salisbury Cathedral. Breathtaking. He returned to the conversation. Angela, a favour if I may, a simple financial query. He asked her advice on some Lloyd's insurance funds that he was interested in, gave her his email address and then rang off. It was difficult to see what that conversation had to do with Billy G, if anything. He looked up to see where we were and then went back to his list. He went to the very top where he'd written, Who Gains? So, who gains, punk? He asked me. The other members of her band? If you could keep hold of your own slightly soiled underpants and were less interested in the inside of Billy G's knickers, who would you be buying? I'm sorry, Bishop, I absolutely, positively failed to drift your catch, I said obscurely. If Billy G stopped making records, who benefits? He asked. Well, Emma B, of course, it's been in all the papers. I shall spare you the ritual argument about newspapers which followed. I, as always, stoutly defended the right of the working man to have ever larger breasted topless girls on page three and articles explaining how to eat my way to multiple orgasms, while the vicar espoused the qualities of his beloved FT, which doesn't even have sports pages. I ask you, well, which of us knew about the rivalry between Emma B and Billy G? I said finally, pleased to have won the day. Ah! But did this insightful journalism, written entirely in words of less than one syllable, wonder if it might not have been a manufactured rivalry? Even Punk Sanderson must know that those apparently great rivals, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, used to secretly coordinate their releases to ensure that they did not coincide. I, as ever, remain resolutely ignorant of any fact more than 20 years old. Your modern-day battle of the alphabet girls is no doubt equally phony, but... A little analysis of their sales figures might prove fruitful. Careful, that truck is stopping. <sighs> I dumped the vicar's uh, mobile office unceremoniously onto the floor. We've been in the car for 40 minutes and had only just reached the Angel Islington. Time for you to follow your roadie's instincts, my dear boy. Follow your nose to the river. I'll see if Sean Fitzpatrick can give us some sales figures. He kept Sean's number in his watch and in my mirror, I could see him pushing a button on the watch, scrolling through to the right number. Sean, how wonderful. A small favour, if I may. <sighs> Sean, Sean, Sean. What can I say? Well, firstly, of course, is that his name is not Sean. I shall probably have to buy him several pints and a couple of hundred Rothmans to apologise to him for giving him such a lame new name. But Sean Fitzpatrick was the best Irish name I could do on the spur of the moment. A total character. He's worked with the vicar for years. a and &R hero and frequent saviour of my vegetarian bacon. Sean as he shall forevermore be known, 
had a brief career as an excellent but penniless musician before he noticed that even the successful rock stars only have a couple of swanky sports cars, while record label executives own entire racing teams, or in Richard Branson's case, a whole airline. He therefore promptly did the poacher turn gamekeeper switch and went to work for a record label, gaining the obligatory expense accounts and limited edition sports cars along the way. There's no such thing as a quick conversation with Sean. The vicar held the receiver away from his ear and I could hear Sean mouthing off in his thick Irish accent. It's fucking ridiculous. You waste your day playing fucking power games with the fucking accountants. What the fuck do they know? Have they had three fucking million selling records in the last year? All they have to do is sign the fucking piece of paper and they will make more fucking money than even they can fucking add up. And I get to make a fucking great record, but no. None of them are willing to make a fucking decision. They just shove it farther and farther up the fucking food chain. I might as well not bother and just go straight to the fucking top myself. No one has got any fucking balls at all. The vicar smiled as Sean vented his fury. Acts of heroism, Sean. Supreme acts of heroism. Without you, there would be no hope for any of them. Sean continued regardless. It's all so fucking stupid. We all know we're going to make the fucking record. This business could be such fun if we could just cut the fucking crap. The music business is unfortunately more concerned with business than it is with music. We all need challenges and yours is to make the suits do the right thing despite their complete inability to know what is good for them, even when it is staring them in the face. Sean was slowly cooling off. It must finally have occurred to him to ask why the vicar had called. An insignificant trifle, Sean. I'm almost embarrassed to ask you to concern yourself with such a trivial matter. I need some sound scan figures. UK sales figures for the last couple of months and then the sales for the next couple of weeks as they come in. You can. You are too kind. I would need them for both Emma B and Billy G. Sean obviously had a lot to say about Billy G. Again, the vicar held the receiver away from his head. It's going to fucking kill her. I was laughing so fucking much, there were tears rolling down my cheeks. You can imagine some bastard changing the song lyrics on the auto cue and putting up the story of the flopsy fucking bunnies or something. You are probably right, the vicar said when Sean finally ran out of steam. If you can please email me the figures as soon as you have them, I shall be forever in your debt, as I already am. Now that should have been the end of the conversation, but Sean obviously had more to say. I saw the smile on the vicar's face start to fade. You have no idea what you are asking, Sean. He made a display of shaking himself as if he had a chill. This is more than a simple favour. Even the thought of it brings me out in a cold sweat. He listened as Sean said something further. This is something that I would rather you did not ask of me. I have not so much set a foot in the place we do not talk about for seven years. You have no idea what will be involved. There would be all manner of aggravation and complications. He sat silently and then drew a deep breath. If you can find no other solution, I will agree. I do business with people, not companies. I will do it as a personal favour for you. But I would ask you to please try your damnedest to find an alternative. He rang off just as we approached the river. A live radio show with the Glamour Twins, broadcast from Malvolio's office. We go as far as despair and then say, Lord, have mercy. He turned his thoughts back to the journey. Turn left along the embankment and we are nearly there, he said, winding down the window and blowing an imaginary cloud off the palm of his hand. <sighs> Let's blow that dark cloud away. It may never happen. That boy's not Bugger man, this is serious! Can't you just leave the friggin' phone alone? Damn, what are the tokens you've logged on? Everybody, shut up! Fuck me, there's gotta be someone to talk to. God, this is going to be shit. To think I trusted you, you complete imbecile. Billy G's career has just been ruined by the cretin you insisted I take on tour. And from what I hear, they even personally told him how to do it!